very nervous now. I'm going to show us all up now. We get to see them. <laughs> Detour around the corner. <laughs> As if you could. Nope. We're all freewheeling. Just get your phone out if you really need. Yes. Yeah. So for the average age of menopause, um, the range was between 50 and 80, the start of menopause. Right. Um, for how many symptoms, average was 10. And then for how many million, how many people, it was one to two million. Okay, I think I need to write this down. Hold on, hold on. The Can average I... age to, to start menopause is 51. Yes, that was yeah, this is, this is audience a quiz. Testing. Can I, am I allowed to? Start the menopause thing.
you can't, I mean, you can't do your bra up, you can't do your zip up, you can't, yeah. you can't really, yeah. you know, you can't move it at all. Yeah. And, and it gradually gets be... worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. But they, they don't know. <laughs> Will it come back? No, no, no. <laughs> I've got really sweaty feet where I'm now that I'm yeah. worried my feet go fall off. Just talk. Still I'll let everyone get seated first. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, perfect. Hello, welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Tian Howell, uh, and I'm going to be uh, your host this evening. Uh, as alongside being a Pilates instructor and personal trainer, I am also the founder of the Librium Menopause Clinic, uh, where we combine Eastern and Western medicine along with lifestyle factors and holistic therapies to best help women through their menopause experience. It's great to see so many of you here, uh, and it's so crucial that we all speak about menopause and we all uh, understand and find as much knowledge as we can. Uh, I embarked on my menopause education, if you will, two years ago, uh, when I started to find ways that I can help my fitness clients that were going through menopause. It was only then that I realized how much it can really affect someone's life, but also how much we can be doing to support them as well. There is a lot more discussion out there, which is brilliant, but there's still a lack of actionable support. And that is why I created my company. And that is why conversations like we're having today are just so crucial. Menopausal women are the fastest growing demographic in the workplace, yet we struggle every day, uh, they struggle every day with symptoms and currently receive limited support from their employers. Over the next hour and a quarter, we hope to break down the stigma that these women face and also give you some actionable uh, points that you can take away and start to help those that are in your company uh, and your own employees. We will have time for questions at the end as well. Uh, so if you are watching on YouTube, then you can write those in the comments as we go. And if you are in the audience, then remember those uh, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So I have a fabulous panel here with me today and I'm gonna read from this so I don't mess up anyone's introduction. So firstly, we've got Caroline Noakes. She is the chair of the Women and Equality Committee and a conservative MP for Romsey and Southampton North. She is a prominent voice for menopause awareness in the government and in a recent report has called for an amendment of the Equality Act to introduce menopause as a protected characteristic and to include a duty for employers to provide reasonable adjustment to their for their menopausal employees. Next up, we've got Denise Wilson, OBE. Denise is the chief executive of the FTSE Women Leaders Review, leading the national business focused task force for increasing the number of women in the FTSE 350 boards and senior leadership positions. She has also served on several corporate and charitable boards throughout her career. Then we have Faye Reed. Faye is an executive assistant and founder of the social media platform and blog, 9to5Menopause. Uh, she works with individuals, organizations, and companies to bring awareness around the impact menopause has on uh, women in the UK. 
Finally, we have Sarah Carolides, who is a top UK nutritionist with over 20 years experience. After graduating from uh, of natural sciences from Cambridge University, Sarah spent several years in the fast paced world of foreign exchange trading before beginning her career in nutrition. She now works as head of nutrition at Zuki. What a mouthful, but what a lineup we have. So Caroline, I want to start with you. As chair of the Women and Equality Committee, you have a particular focus on menopause in the workplace. Can you start by outlining the issues that we, these women are facing? So the committee started looking at menopause and launched the inquiry in July of last year uh, and published our report in July this year. So effectively, it took up a year of the committee's time and I always say a year of my life. Uh, really helpful for me as a went into this as a 49-year-old woman and came out the other side as a 50-year-old uh, to actually look at some of the issues that other women were facing in the workplace to hear, I always say this, to hear the horror stories as well as some brilliant examples of best practice. And we had an array of witnesses from different organisations, from NHS Trust, from the police, fire service, lawyers come and sit in front of us and tell us exactly what their organisations were doing from a legal perspective, what more they would like to see done. And in July, we published a report with a whole raft of recommendations to government, which uh, they then have 12 weeks to respond to the suggestions that we've made. I think that 12 weeks is up next week. Um, and so it will be interesting to see what new government comes back with. But the things that really stuck out to me were issues like, and, and, the, and we ran a big survey, so I think over 2,000 women completed a survey outlining the experiences that they've had. And, and what we learned from that was something like 43% of women uh, felt that they were being uh, either pushed out of work, literally pushed out of work because of their medical symptoms, or their symptoms were so bad that they themselves felt that they couldn't carry on. There was some great research done in the city last year which indicated that as many as 50% of women didn't take a promotion at work because of their menopause symptoms. And, and their stat was that 25% had left work altogether. We know that Booper felt that there was about a million women had left work because of their menopause symptoms. And look, my view, and I think I went into it not really understanding the scale of the problem, I've certainly come out the other side of this report going, we can't afford to lose experienced, brilliant women at the peak of their careers from the workforce for many reasons. For themselves, primarily, because this is having an impact on women's incomes, on families, uh, in, as we're in a cost of living crisis, it's having an impact on the economy more generally, but it's also having an impact on individual businesses and younger women in those organisations. Okay, well, hang on, though, where have all the 50 year olds gone? And why are all the managers men? Because the women have left. And, and to me, you know, it's about individual incomes, it's about the gender pension gap, so it means that women are making fewer contributions to their pension fund. We can't allow this to happen. We can't allow a whole chunk of the female workforce to just be erased because of symptoms that if we're all a little bit more determined to break down the taboo, if employers are more willing to put in place reasonable adjustments to help women stay in work, we can tackle this. We can make the journey through menopause smoother. Now, look, I know that not everybody will suffer hideous menopause symptoms and that some people will have very minor symptoms or none at all. And some people won't want to talk about it. And I think what I basically want to, to get a message out there is that we have to create within workplaces a uh, an atmosphere that allows people to talk about it if they want to and allows them not to if they don't. So that <coughs> employers and colleagues can understand the experience that... Uh, every woman will go through, you know, you can't avoid it sadly, um, and just make sure that we look at, and uh, this is what we said to the government, they look at uh, introducing policies, changes to the Equalities Act, um, because the, the stark reality is that the menopause affects your confidence, so it creates anxiety, and we currently have a system where it's really difficult for a menopausal woman to bring a tribunal case against an employer using their menopause symptoms I think since between 2017 and 2021, there's something like only 44 cases in total brought. Well, we know that there are four and a half million menopausal women in the workplace, so 44 cases either suggest that there's not a problem, and there is, or it suggests that women are not not being able to bring cases. The, the, the Equalities Act requires you to bring it only under one ground, either age or sex, and we know that actually menopause is a combination of the two. So the, the government can make a really easy adjustment straight away. Uh, and enact Section 14 of the Equalities Act, 
and they could look at consulting to make human menopause a protective characteristic in its own right. That's a great answer. Um, I, <laughs> there was there was a lot there, um, but I think no, no, no. I there's a lot that, that we can we can all take away. Um, I think it's really important that we uh, or everyone kind of understands the symptoms as well. Um, I'm sure you agree um, that there there's a lack of understanding, maybe from. You know, I'm a 50 year old woman. And 12 months ago, I had no idea what menopausal symptoms are. I was living later, but I didn't know, you know, and I never put two and two together and came up with, ooh, menopause, as my number four. Um, you know, it's the, the hideous, and so many of them are really debilitating. So insomnia, mm. how on earth can you perform at the best of your ability when you're going to work and you've had zero hours sleep? Um, hideous, you know, the hot flushes and the sweats. I would sometimes be standing in the House of Commons actually able to feel sweat dripping down my back going, oh, that's frank, isn't it? Oh. Um, and didn't know what it was. Yeah. And you know, I like to think I was reasonably well informed, reasonably well educated. I'm thinking, what, what is this? So why aren't we doing a better job about teaching young people in school? Mm. We obsess with teaching them in PSHG how not to get pregnant. We don't do a great job of saying mm. that there will come a time when you can't. Yeah. Yeah, no, abso absolutely. Uh, there was also a questionnaire that went out. So some of some of you guys uh, may have answered it. And I have uh, both the answers here and also the highest figures and the lowest figures to, to see how much you guys know about uh, the menopause as well. So you had three questions. The first one, what is the average age a woman goes through menopause? Um, the lowest number was 50. Not bad. The highest number was 80. A woman, you know, there, there will probably be a few people that have gone through it in their 80s, but that's very, very rare. <laughs> so I'll give you the actual statistics. So the average age for a woman to go through menopause is 51, with an average uh, range between 40 and 58. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I have seen women go through it in their 30s and in their 60s. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so... Um, varied and it really depends on someone's uh, experience um so it's important that we don't kind of say okay they're 50 they must be going through it it's not that at all uh your second question where are the questions there we are uh how many symptoms are there and the answer seems to be about 10. now i can tell you that there the nhs say that there are 34 common symptoms of menopause but we were discussing this earlier, and I have seen as many as 60. Um, Faye, how many was it that you said you saw? Um, it was like about 40, 49. 49, yeah. So that just kind of drives home that the experience is going to be so unique for every individual uh, woman. And only 80% have hot flushes, and I think that's the main symptom that most people recognise uh, with menopause. So if someone doesn't have hot flushes and they don't know that they are uh, the other symptoms, then how do they know that they're going through menopause? So I think it's important we all educate ourselves and we can also help those women um, as, as they do come up to it, know that there are other symptoms and it might be menopause why they're having these symptoms. Uh, the final question you had was, how many female employees are currently going through menopause? And the answers varied between one and two million. Um, as you just said, there are 4.5 million women in the UK uh, in work that are currently going through menopause. So that's such a large number. So it really just drives home how important conversations like this are. Uh, menopause is actually only one day. And I think it's really interesting to know um, the different terminology. And if you read the literature, it does not make sense if you don't know this terminology. And also the terminology isn't that common to find out there. So you have four stages of menopause. You have premenopause, that's anything before you experience any symptoms uh, and any hormonal imbalances. Uh, you are then perimenopausal as soon as you start to experience symptoms, the uh, hormones start to change. And then exactly one year after a lady's last period is their menopause day. So menopause is actually only one day. And I've spoken about it to you guys. I genuinely think that it should be celebrated like a sweet 16. Do with that information what you will. Let's create a thing. Let's make it a thing. Uh, after that, they are postmenopausal, but you can still experience symptoms in postmenopause as well. So it's important not to disregard those women as well. So I'm going to stop talking. And Faye, I think that leads us quite nicely on to you because you have a very interesting journey when it comes to menopause, especially in the workplace. So would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Wow. 
Um, I started my menopause journey when I was 45. I just started a job. I'm a personal assistant by trade. I uh, started a brand new job supporting a CEO. So it was in that first week I had my first hot flush. Um, I had no idea what it was. It was just a whoosh of heat from my chest to my head. And it was only when it happened a few more times, I realized like, oh my God, I think I'm starting to menopause. Um, I laughed. I was 45, I was still going out, drinking, partying, buying clothes, being semi-responsible. Um, so to think that I was starting to menopause, I was just like, it's a bit of a joke. Um, and I was actually, <laughs> I did. I was like, no, this isn't happening. And I was fine for the first year, just took myself off to, um, um, and got some vitamins and stuff, because first and foremost, I'm very much a holistic person. And I just managed it with some vitamins. But then my world kind of imploded. And it's kind of well known that stress triggers will kind of amplify a woman's um, symptoms. So for me, um, the diagnosis, my mum had cancer for the second time, and she was diagnosed as terminal. And my symptoms fell off a cliff. My job also got super stressful. I hadn't said anything to anybody in work about my menopause. I just kind of dealt with it. So I developed severe anxiety. I had insomnia. I had brain fog. And I had severe night and day sweats as well. So you can imagine supporting a CEO um, and having brain fog didn't really work. So um, we'd have a meeting. He'd ask me a question. And then two seconds later, I'd go, sorry, what was that? I'd have to ask him again. Um, and also not sleeping, like getting up day after day and that, not having slept the night before and then having to commute to work. It was just hell. But I think the worst thing was my anxiety. And it was from having anxiety, I actually started to see a therapist because I wasn't coping with the fact that my mum was going to die. I was really struggling with that. And it was my therapist that said it be, might be a good idea to see your GP. And up until this point, I hadn't even thought about going to see my GP about any help or anything. And after talking to my doctor for about, well, I cried for two minutes initially, and she passed me tissues and said, then you're ready. Just tell us what the problem is. <laughs> um, and she said, yes, it does sound like you are starting the menopause. Let's do some blood tests. Um, but also let's get you some help and straight off the bat she gave me HRT and it's not something I would normally go for because I'm very much holistic natural remedies but I tried it and yeah I'm pretty pleased I did. How was it how long was it between uh, you starting to notice symptoms and starting the HRT? Um, a year and a half. A year and a half. A year and a half because I just kind of put up it was just initially hot flushes I was having that was the only kind of symptom I had and I kind of just dealt with it I changed my journey to work because I live in Shoreditch and the company I worked for was in Richmond so I changed that commute so I didn't have to do the tube because getting on at Old Street when the tube was already packed was like no nah, this isn't gonna work <laughs> I'd be sweating in a carriage like mm. crammed in like this and I just start to get more and more anxious as um, I started to sweat more, so I was like, I can't do this journey. No, mm. I'm going to do a longer route, forget this. Mm. Um, and I kind of just started to do a little bit of investigation into it, really. And I kind of changed my whole wardrobe because synthetic fibres will just exacerbate the sweats. So I only wear cotton and natural fibres now. So just little things I did. But yeah, it was after a year and a half I had to kind of seek mm. um, professional help. Right. And Sarah, your journey with menopause was quite different to phase. So would you mind discussing a little bit about no, your, your was experience? The, the reason mine was different was because I knew what was coming. So the first I, insomnia was the first symptom for me. And the minute it happened, I was like, OK, I know what's going on here. So I actually did a hormone test on myself and then uh, went to see a gynecologist, um, got the HRT. And it took a while to get it right. But because I knew what I was dealing with, I really didn't have much of a problem with it. But it was all yeah, because I had the knowledge. Mm. Yeah. And that, that's what's missing. Yeah. It, it really can make such a difference by not waiting um, 
so so long and getting on the right HRT and getting the right help. Um, and that's so important for companies to be aware of as well and making sure that they're proactive in helping those um, women if they if they do seek that help. Um, so carrying on with uh, the, a woman's experience in um, with menopause in the workplace, Denise, you have a, a lot of knowledge with um, and experience with women in senior positions across many different industries. What have you noticed that uh, of the role that menopause plays in shaping a woman's career at this stage? Well, look, I think Caroline set out very well the issues that face senior women. Um, my role and work is to persuade, cajole, arm twist, uh, influence senior business men, and they are largely men, uh, to appoint more women to senior leadership teams. And uh, we've been doing that now quite seriously in the UK for about 12 years, and we are making progress, but it's hard and it's terribly slow. And women um, face issues all the way throughout their careers, not refined in the early years. But as soon as women hit around 30, um, the pyramid of women getting promoted and going on to the top is very, very drastically reduced. And there are many reasons for that. Some would say it's childcare, maternity. We know it's absolutely not. Um, it, Gender stereotyping, what kind of roles women can do, what kind of roles they can't, sort of microaggressions in the workplace, uh, cultures where women feel they don't fit. There are, uh, and then women being underemployed, watching men with less capabilities float on seamlessly up while they sit there underpaid and underemployed. And the underemployment in the UK of women is shocking in this country uh, and not getting any better. So there are a whole host of barriers and issues that face women throughout. And maternity is one of the biggest ones. And incredibly, we know that it isn't um, just having a baby and being off on maternity that tars women with that brush of not ready yet. Let's not put them up. They won't want to travel. They won't want a promotion yet. All women, whether they have children or not, get tired with that same brush. So there are no more women at the top that don't have children than women that do have children. And getting through that, the arguments that we have made, um, and it's getting easier, it's getting a lot easier as the gene pool is changing. But the arguments that we have made are about supporting women through those maternity years. But importantly, because once they get through that, through childbearing years and through responsibilities of families, they come back, they're experienced, they're strong, they've learned how to cope with many different, juggle many different things in their lives. And they're very valuable uh, employees in the workforce. And they have an inner energy and uh, an enthusiasm when the kind of shackles of families are off to go on and, and achieve. And, you know, you can see that in some of the women here. And so if women are not being, if, if at that very point, age 49 to 50, menopause is hitting, then that's just like another gate closed, another barrier that women have to overcome. And that's why it's really important the workplace, the workplace supports women uh, and that we, we, we do something about menopause and, 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 and it's taken seriously and it's understood in the workplace because, you know, we can't allow women to fail at that, uh, at that important point just as they're about to, to unleash their, their kind of power and their potential. I would just say a word of caution, though. Um, having seen how hard it is to persuade uh, British business leaders of the strength of capability in the female workforce, that we need to tread quite carefully. And we don't want this to appear just another reason for not appointing women. So we do need to roll it out sympathetically. Uh, and we do need to support both men and women in the workplace on this. And we need to just uh, do it step by step and do it carefully. We'll come back to that in a minute. I think. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's a lovely way to open that conversation. Um, and Caroline, can you give us some ways that we can change how companies can perceive menopause? Um, yeah, I mean, Denise and I are not going to fall out on the subject, uh, but I think 
I, I tend to have a little blunder bus approach to everything, uh, so I can give a great long list of things that I would love every company to do. Uh, first and foremost, put in place the workplace menopause policy, but I get a little bit touchy about policies, because policies are only any good if they're living, breathing documents, and they are no use to anyone if they're shoved in a filing cabinet. I did a brilliant event last week for well-being of women when uh, a woman uh, in the audience from Aviva stood up in the Q&A bit, and she went, I'm from Aviva and we don't have a workplace menopause policy, and I was about to start wagging my finger, and she went, because actually we live it every day in the company and we support all employees, whether they're male or female, and, and I thought actually this is a really brilliant way of doing it. And I'm very conscious that over the past 10 years or so, we've got a lot better about talking about mental health in the workplace. We also have to be a lot better about talking about menopause in the workplace. And uh, one of the recommendations the committee made was that employers should have uh, a workplace menopause champion so that there is always a safe space for women who want to talk about issues to, to have someone to talk to. I think that, first and foremost, is one of the most important things. And I'm always struck, and I have spent, as I said, I've spent over about 18 months talking about this issue. And I go up and down the country and I talk to lots of different organisations, big and small. Uh, I was once sat in a, a room at Scania uh, talking effectively to people who make trucks. Um, and the thing that strikes me is how keen men are to get involved in the conversation. And I think that's absolutely something that we have to celebrate and encourage uh, because every man will have a mother or a colleague or an employer or an employee or a partner uh, that at some point we'll go through this. And so I get really cross when I hear, and I do hear it, and people always like to have um, a bit of a pop, but I'm a politician, so I have to take that on the chin. <laughs> oh, why are you dragging men into this? We don't want to hear about it. You need to hear about it. And actually, as women, we need to be talking about it to men completely candidly and openly. Um, and so I think that there's a, there's a massive piece of work to do to break down the stigma and the taboo around it. And I think it's really... Difficult. I know it was difficult for me, and I genuinely sat on uh, in Parliament last year when we were debating Karen Harris's brilliant bill around HRT, listening to Liz Kendall, who uh, was the shadow minister at the time, I think she's off on maternity leave at the moment, and, and Liz was reeling off her menopause symptoms, and I was in a state of huge denial, and Liz was talking about uh, insomnia, she was talking about uh, night sweats, and she was talking about anxiety and I kept saying, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's not, oh. is that it, it's all, and it's like the penny dropping and I just think it's really important that employers and employees have, have the confidence to talk about and I think the thing that will live with me probably until my dying day is when I got an email uh, as chair of the select committee when we launched the inquiry from one of my own constituents who was an HR director of a, a blue chip company and she said to me, I don't want to give evidence to the committee. I don't want my name ever to become public because I don't want my employer to ever know that I'm going through the menopause. And that just made me want to put my head in my hands. She was the HR director and she was still scared of the impact it would have. And I think I'm sometimes a little bit guilty of this um, and sort of being a bit, you know, in your face and saying, everybody has to talk about it. No, you don't. Um, but we all have a, a role to play in making other people feel comfortable about talking about it. And something that I haven't said, and I always pull myself up on this, hopefully before somebody else does, because I'm very conscious of this, is that I endlessly talk about 49 to 51-year-old women. And I mustn't, because the reality is, is that many women will go through the menopause much, much earlier, mm -hmm. and employers will dismiss that. Well, it can't be that, can it? And actually, the woman herself might dismiss it. It can't yeah. be that. Um, and if you go through early menopause, it can be much more dramatic, uh, much more uh, debilitating symptoms very, very quickly. So, you know, with me, it crept up on me. So it crept up right. on me so silently, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, but if you go through it younger, it might be for surgical reasons. It can be very significant symptoms very, very quickly. And, and we have to be aware of that and we're alive to the fact that not everybody's going to be uh, a 50 year old woman, that it can happen a lot earlier. And, you know, it's just about creating a space where people have the confidence to talk about it. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I I know a lot of people that are menopausal that didn't even open up that they were menopausal until I launched my company. And then people that were quite close to me came up and were like, oh, my gosh, I've had this symptom, this symptom. So I think a lot of women don't want to talk about it to people that aren't currently going through it. Um, so I think if we 
people that aren't going through it can open up and even just just say menopause and you probably get a lot more <laughs> just go whisper menopause uh, bring it up in conversation and bring up that you've, you've come to events like this and uh, see how many people open up to you and um, just be there to listen and learn and support them as well. Uh, on the subject of uh, what we can do um, as, as or corporates can do, um, Sarah, as head of nutrition at Zuki, can you highlight some of the simple things that corporates can do to support menopausal employees? Sure, and I think I love sort of what's been said so far. I think one of the simple things they can do actually is take the fear away because. Menopause sounds so completely chaotic. It really does. You don't know what's going to happen, all the, at least 49 different symptoms. It is an absolute mess. But the truth is that actually every woman is going through the same journey. Progesterone starts to fall first. Estrogen is out of whack. You've got these different levels. You'll get certain symptoms there. And then the estrogen comes down sort of later on. But it's those differences in the hormone level. We are actually going through the same journey. So once you get that, it's a little bit simpler to understand. And it doesn't sound quite so chaotic. One of the things it does affect is a woman's ability to deal with sugar and her insulin. You become far more at risk of developing something called insulin resistance, which can go on to type 2 diabetes and things. So going around nutrition, I mean, for instance, everyone in this room, if I said to you there's a pregnant woman here, you can think, okay, she's going to need a break, she's going to need to sit down, and she might need a snack. It's easy, there's no fear, you know, we understand it. Menopausal woman, you probably think, okay, I might need to open the window, I have no idea what else she might need, because it's just not understood. What she's going to need is different snacks. What she does not need is the biscuits and caffeine in the room. Mm. Let's get some herb teas, let's get some nuts and seeds, or some non-sugar snacks, something like that. <laughs> um, you know, she might need a break. How about a walking meeting? Get out in the fresh air, have a walking meeting, something like that. You don't always need to be sitting around a desk. Uh, if you have got a canteen, again, the non-sugary, healthy, slow sugar releasing, make sure there's a good source of protein there. I mean, these are healthy things for everybody, actually, not just men, of course, yeah. women. But taking into account that the more sugar they have, the more their system's going to be out of whack and so actually finding out what people need at that stage what's going to help them get through the day keep their energy levels more stable uh what else yeah the alternatives to caffeine i've wrote down a few things um availability of supplements if you've got the budget for that so collagen so omega threes so all these zippy things that we've got there um yeah i mean and then it's just really it, it's it's just the education isn't it it's finding out what they need and providing things like that to help them nutritionalize. Mm, absolutely. I, I will just add one more point onto that. Alco alcohol can also affect menopausal symptoms a lot. Not everyone wants to go alcohol free, not everyone wants to <laughs> reduce it. <laughs> 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 just give, give you all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> giving uh, alternatives uh, to alcohol as well, and also not penalizing someone that doesn't want to drink. Uh, we shouldn't do that anyway. But um, the, like we've got Clean Co out there, which is a brilliant alternative to alcohol. Um, so ha maybe providing something like that at work events. Um, and things like that and what exactly what you said ask a woman what they need in that situation if they if there is something in particular then just be a, be hospitable and help them through the process there's a huge amount going on just i mean not it's you know you think of sort of the reproductive hormones but actually estrogen and progesterone have effects all over the body the brain literally rewires itself reconfigures itself during menopause the same thing happens with the immune system there's so much going on so the more you can help them the better and just mm. relieve those symptoms and yeah i think going alcohol free not having to have the alcohol at every meeting or lunch is, is good option. yeah yeah no absolutely <laughs> cut him down cut, yeah. cut him down, down. Not cut up, <laughs> <laughs> um and so I want to turn to you now um, and speak a little bit about HRT, which is also um, a massive support factor for uh, women going through menopause. And you, you touched on it earlier. Uh, but I want to ask you why you think there is still a stigma around HRT and also touch on your own personal experience with HRT. Um, I think there's still a massive 
stigma around HRT because I think there was a lot of negative information that went out there in, in the, the press, press and, and the media. media. I, I also think, think that women have listened to stories or scare stories about HRT mm -hmm. and they've kind of kept that and not but and not learn anything else around it. I mean, I myself, I'm very much, as I said, holistic and homeopathic person, first and foremost. And it was only my GP, because I was on the floor when I went to her, that said, take these tablets. And I was like, I just bit her hand off. I went, I'll take anything, because I felt so bad. But I didn't have the knowledge around HRT. But because my doctor gave it to me, I kind of trusted her. But also, she initially prescribed tablets for me. And I was just like, yeah, I feel okay. Because I didn't know what to expect. Um, and she checked in on me after I had my blood pressure checked and everything else like that. And she said, okay, let's increase your dose. Because I didn't really feel any different. So she increased the dose. And then it was like, still didn't feel great. She changed the tablets. And it, from, it was from there that I started to realise HRT isn't just one tablet. There's loads of different ones. And I was really surprised. There's loads of tablets. There's loads of different patches. Initially, I was on tablets. They got discontinued. But then I went on to patches. I was like, Eureka, this is great. I felt so much better. Um, and then at the start of Brexit, I couldn't get hold of my patches. I've been on them for about two years. And then I started to panic. And I was like, OK. By that stage, I started to do my own research. And I went back to my GP and I said, I'd like to get the Mirena coil and use estrogel alongside it. And it's the best I've ever felt in about 10 years. And all my family and all my friends say, like, they've got payback. This is what you used to be like. So, and I want women to know that HRT isn't an automatic fix, but at the same time, don't just dismiss it out of hand. Do your research. Find out if you'd like to take it and speak to a practitioner, your GP, and just see what could work for you. And just remember, it isn't just one tablet. There's loads of different options out there, loads of different gels, loads of different patches, and you can find something that works for you. Because I just, why suffer? This mm. is the best I've ever felt. <laughs> why, why suffer? Why no suffer? Point. There's Absolutely. just no point. Mm. You can still have a really good, fulfilled life still enjoy yourself and just yeah you, we live a lot longer these days so I just think take the help if you can get it and just yeah live your life yeah absolutely um I think it's also important to go back to the first thing you said that you you are very holistic yes and originally you didn't want to take HRT which is yes. it's always an option but it is a woman's option whether they take it or not it's important to remember that HRT isn't a quick fix and it is going to take yeah, time, time to get onto the right um, HRT. But also remember that you've still got those lifestyle factors that are still going to be contributing now. And it's a combination of the two that I'm sure you find yeah, most I still beneficial. Take vitamins as well. Yeah. I take yeah. magnesium, I take collagen, I take vitamin D. Um, I was found to have to be really deficient in vitamin D. So I take quite a high dose of that. I think because like however many years we were in lockdown, didn't go away, didn't go on mm. holiday, <laughs> didn't go out, mm. didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was hardly surprising I was deficient. But yeah, I still take vitamins alongside my yeah. HRT. And I also exercise. That's yes. another thing to take into account. Yes. You don't have to take HRT. There are other things you can do, mm -hmm. but it's an option and it's there to help you. Mm. Yes. Um, and you, you touched on your experience with HRT and the not being able to get certain HRTs. And Caroline, I want to speak oh, to you because yeah. <laughs> uh, we had a really interesting talk about uh, you went into detail on the not being able to get the right, right uh, HRT and this. Yeah, and you know, um, when was it? Back in January, where there was a big problem with supplies of, and apologies if I launch into brand names, I don't mean to, but I can't get around it, estrogel. A massive problem with the supply of estrogel. And I always remember this from a personal perspective. So I'd been on estrogel for about two months at that point, uh, and I had to get a repeat prescription and was told, You can't you can't get estrogel. So we're not going to prescribe that. We're going to give you Sandrina. Now that's all very well and good, but Sandrina comes in these teeny tiny sachets. I was on quite a massive dosage by that time. And you can see in the box, you're like, 
I've got three days left. Uh, and that, that was giving me the anxiety. Uh, you've got anxiety anyway. And I literally, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? Um, and, and that was uh, at the time that Chad and Harris, me, and I can't remember who the third MP was, raised this in business questions. And I was not expected to take off quite a moment ago. I was being bombarded with constituent women who were saying, you can't get extra jail in any of the farm people in Southampton, you can't get in any of the farm people in Washington, which is just us. So I raised it in the house, and suddenly everyone said, no, that is not just you. Um, and the so medical task force was set up by government. There were the serious shortage protocols put in place. Now, the stark reality is we had a medical czar who was uh, seconded from the vaccination program, Maddie McTurner. She did, I mean, she did amazing work, but the reality is, is there are still shortage protocols in place, I think, for 11 of the 13 products that there was a problem with. Um, and it's my big fear. Uh, and, and politics is a, a difficult, challenging uh thing at the moment i couldn't think of the right word that's a medical <laughs> thing i keep saying i can't think of the right word which is a good thing um but my worry is is that as the spotlight turns off menopause and turns off uh hrt shortages that uh, everybody moves up we see that from um some former prime ministers uh always you say we well, i consider the matter close we've moved on from that uh actually we haven't moved on from the shortages and my big fear is that Maddie's gone back to doing uh, vaccinations and that there is a, there's still challenges. And you know, we have the Women's Health Strategy in place. We have uh, Dame Leslie Regan, the most amazing woman, who is now the Women's yeah. Health Ambassador. Um, but I don't want the new government, the new health secretary, to think that people like me, people like Karen Harris, and campaigns I've never done, we're going to turn gas down. We're not. We need the pressure to be kept up. We need a national formula for HRT. We need every woman to be able to get a hold of the body, identical HRT. We need things like testosterone, apologies mm. for what I'm about to say, and I can't get through uh, anything without discussing sex. So look, um, testosterone is really hard to get hold of. You have to bowl into your doctor and say, I have a problem with low libido, therefore you have to prescribe me testosterone as well. Actually, we all know that testosterone helps with um, brain fog and your mental processes. And that's the thing that I find most challenging. You know, I'm, I live in a world where I have to perform day in, day out. I have to be able to think of the right word. I have to be able to have the confidence to stand up and give speeches. Testosterone really helps that, but I can only get that if I say, oh, and I've got no sex drive. Uh, and I might have mentioned that to somebody quite close to me. He said, oh, for God's sake, I didn't want you to prescribe that. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> never get through one of those without saying something inappropriate. Um, and, you know, and that's the real challenge. We need a national formulary for HRT. We need there to be wider understanding. We need testosterone to be more widely available and doctors to be able to prescribe it, not just because you've got low libido, because your brain's turned to mush. Um, and so those are challenges that I expect my committee to still have when the government responds to our report in a week, two weeks, however long it takes them. Um, and it will be something, you know, Carolyn has just applied for another backlash business debate on National Menopause Day. I stood up in the House two, three weeks ago uh, to do a statement on menopause. It is our job to keep this in the headlines, to keep it in the forefront of ministers' mm. minds and not to just, you know, I think everyone would find life a lot easier if we were to just shut up and go away and be well behaved for women and you know that's never gonna happen <laughs> it absolutely shouldn't happen hey can you touch on the pricing of hrt as well um can i just say really quickly yeah, hrt isn't just to alleviate your symptoms it also helps to stave off like things like brittle bone because we lose bone density as we yeah. get older and go through that transition so it is a beneficial thing to take um, price of HRT in this country is shocking. Um, it was only a few months ago I found out that um, HRT in Scotland and Wales for women is free. They don't have to pay for it. And in the UK, some women pay upwards of like 30, 40 pounds a month for their HRT prescription. There is a thing that you can do. You can get a prepayment certificate which I think you can get six months or a yearly one, and you just pay um, a block price, and that pays for all your prescriptions during that period. But yeah, the cost of HRT is quite expensive. And I forgot to say that, didn't I? So no, last fine, go for it. October, uh, we got Carolyn and Harris's private members bill through the house that there would be an annual prescription for HRT. 
uh, which meant that you would only pay one charge and it and I'm bad at remembering how much prescription is. I think it's nine pounds seventy five, so it's eighteen nineteen pounds fifty. Is that the maths right? Um, for progesterone and estrogen on one prescription. And we thought when that was passed, when the minister stood up in the house and said, this is going to happen, there were cheers all around, we were very happy, not realising that, that the introduction of that was going to be delayed until April 23. I think most of us assumed it would come in in the new financial year, so April 22. My big worry at the moment is that we're still waiting another six months before that comes in. And when you're in a cost of living crisis, when you're making decisions about whether you can afford your heating or your food or to put fuel in the car, actually, women are really bad at putting themselves yeah. first really bad and so actually 20 quid for your hrt prescription and, and a lot of women will be on it monthly particularly at first because it's kind of trial and error process mm. and you'll be trying different ones um so i've been quite outspoken and, and unpleasant to ministers on that subject but um you know i would really love it if to raise coffee as the new secretary of state for health the first time we've had a woman in that job since 2007 just bowled in and said, okay, let's do it now. You know, she's a woman of 51. She could crack on and she could help all of those other women of 51, mm. couldn't she? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's important to know, going back to kind of um, HRT in a corporate setting, is that could be quite a worry for women going through that. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, if you do have someone that's menopausal, um, that they might have that, that worry as well. Um, so... I'm going to skip a couple of questions just so we're on time. Um, Denise, can you highlight some good examples of corporate practice um, and list any um, anyone and any corporate um, companies that are currently doing a really great job? Um, yeah, look, I think this is a relatively new topic for business. So um, Channel 4, Viva, were pretty much the first out with their policies and programs in 2019. So it is a relatively new topic. Uh, I think if you look at Henpict, uh, I think the Henpict stats are about 70, 75% of workplaces do not have any form of menopause policy or program or support. So we've still got a very long way to go. Um, those programs, I mean, let me talk about one in particular, Lloyd Bank, which I think is really great. Um, they have various components to it. So they have a, a Bupa Health offering, which um, women can subscribe to, but I think it's kind of part sponsored by the company as well. So it's subsidized, uh, where they can talk to doctors as opposed to nurses, because doctors can prescribe, whereas nurses can't. Uh, and they have access to counseling and support. Uh, incidentally, Aviva have got a great app as well if anybody wants to take a look at that, which uh, has got nurses support and counselling on too. So there's actually the sort of health offering there. Then there's what can be done in the workplace around occupational health. So you know, a lot of these things are very cheap and very easy. So although most of the big corporates are now looking at it and, and, and some are still slow to come out, but others are coming out, smaller companies as well can still do something on this front. So flexible working, avoiding um, peak travel times into work, allowing women to work at home on, on days when they feel uh, when they feel ill. Um, things in the workplace like a fan on your desk or a cool room where the temperature is lower than elsewhere in the office. Uniforms, I think you mentioned Bay around cotton as opposed to, so those those staff that are on the front desk having a, um, having a uniform that's menopause friendly. Uh, as opposed to otherwise. There's apparently seat pads that you can get, cool mm. seat pads that uh, are, are refrigerated. So, there, you know, there's lots of, of uh, small things like that. But the one that I like most is the support of leaders and men. And so that is training, whether it's an online training or it's a face-to-face -face training, training that informs about menopause and what it is and how you can support people in the, in the workplace and gives leaders some guidance as to how to do this. So, you know, book a quiet room where nobody's talking, follow up, uh, explain what the workplace can do to off, um, in order to support employees. That's really, really important. But the other thing, the other part, I think that um, a lot of either women themselves or the workplaces are organizing is networks. And that's phenomenally supportive to be able to have women get together on this topic, so menopause, a network for women who are 51. 
uh, and uh, whatever age and want to talk about this. So it's it's a, a combined package. Uh, and there's, yeah, there's some really, there's, there's some, I mean, I'm quite impressed. I think they're, but they're, we've got a long way to go with the other 77% that have to come out. But what has mm. come out is uh, is wholesome and is, and is pretty comprehensive too. Brilliant. That's really reassuring. Um, and Faye, would you mind telling us a little bit more about what you're doing with 95 Menopause and how you're supporting uh, companies improve their menopause one support? Of, one of the things I wanted to do when I started the menopause, really, and I couldn't find any information online, I knew I wanted to just launch a social media platform and just to share my story so other women could connect and just see like what I was doing and going through. And specifically around going to work, because when I started to look into this, nobody, I could find nobody who had a job talking about the menopause. I was like, this is insane. I can't be the only person. So hence, I heard the record Dolly Parton working nine to five on the radio. And I was like, ah, oh, nine to five menopause. That's what I'll call it. Um, and one of the things I do is I do awareness chats. I go into companies, uh, tell them my story and just kind of get them to know what the menopause is, get them to talk to their staff. I very much actively invite men to attend as well, because they could have be line managing staff, they could have partners at home, and it's just to kind of tell them what the menopause is and to take the stigma out of it. It's a normal transition that women are going through. It amazed me, and I myself held a bit of a stigma around it when I first started, but now I just openly talk about it because it's like, it's normal. It's, it's not a big deal. Mm. I'm going to open um, this question up to all of you. Is there any other um, advice you have for um, both women going through menopause and also what companies can do to support? And um, Sarah, if you have something, I'd love for you to start. Um, I think you've got to treat it like, like pregnancy. You've got to get proactive and you've got to get organized. You've got to think, okay, these foods are not going to work for me. Uh, one, one, of the thing I, one of the things I find helps women a lot is having protein before 10 a.m. Having so, so swapping the breakfast, forget the toast and marmalade, have some eggs or something. That, because it actually work, it, it kind of resets the clock genes that work on your metabolism and insulin sensitivity. So getting protein with every meal and having it first thing in the morning seems to really help. Um, another big thing, estrogen reinforces the lining of the gut. So going through menopause, you may find suddenly you're sensitive to more foods or your digestion's upset a bit more easily. So working on the health of your gut, probiotics, prebiotics, whatever it is you need, uh, and working out if there are any foods that aren't working for you anymore. Uh, so looking after the gut, get the protein in there. And then there's loads more. I mean, I could, I've got a whole list here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we can put that on the Zuki website. Maybe you can do something. Yeah, you've like got one, one more Just, tip for us. One more um, water. Water. water helps everything and, and, and fiber constipation is a common problem so just the water and the fiber keeping everything moving yeah uh, would anyone else like to um, step in and uh, I will, I will. Yeah? I will I would say to everybody in this room if you're not seeing what you'd like to see on this topic from the workplace then use your voice lift your hand you know the journey that we've been on with women in the workplace is a very long one, but it's one of a million and one tiny small steps. Mm -hmm. And you all have the power to affect change. And I think we all stand a little bit taller when we try and do that. So go forward. As Denise said, use your voice. Um, and I think too long, I was too quiet. No one's going to accuse me of that anymore. Um, but it really is be brave enough to talk about it. Yeah, be brave enough. I like that. Say hey, anything. Um, just echoing what these ladies have said. I was in a job for five years. I started the first week, had a hot flush, and I never said a word mm -hmm. to anybody. When I look back, that's just insane. So yeah, speak up. Um, don't be embarrassed. It's, yeah, just talk about it. Awesome. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, you can write your questions out now. Uh, oh, we've got the questions ready. We're going to start with those in the audience. So if you raise your hand uh, and say your name, and if you'd like to say the company you're representing as well today, then that'd be brilliant. Um, and then ask your question. Any hands? Yes. Um, do we need a mic? Oh, we do need a mic. 
<laughs> We've got a mic running. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Veronica. I'm, I'm just here because my daughter, she invited me. I work with the district nurses. I go to house to house. One of the things I didn't hear anyone talk about was the heavy periods. Works when you work in an office because you can go and change. But when you work in a community and you have to, to go, you have to plan your day yeah. around the toilet, how to change your pad. And I think this is where I see the divide because no one talks about it. Because I had to cancel a shift. I work on Sunday and was just madness. And I had to cancel my shift on Monday because there was no, because we had the bank holiday. No bank holiday was the queen funeral. Then everything was closed and I couldn't go to work. Not because I was sick, it's because I had my prayers very heavy. Mm. And I didn't have a place to change. And I'm just wonder, you know, within your talks, do you ever talk about the people that are not sitting in, in, the, in the office yeah. and when they are on their periods? Yeah. Yeah. There's something that you can mm. talk about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> a couple of things. One okay. is you've got to watch your iron levels as well. And that's oh. a period start. Yeah. <laughs> and secondly, I do know there are companies, and there's a lady sitting here in the audience, that mm. are making products for exactly that mm. sort of leaks, heavy periods and things. So I can connect you, but there are, <laughs> I've got the name of the company, sorry, Kelly. There you go. Um, who are making underwear exactly for those. There are people, there are women out mm. there starting to deal with these issues. That's my little point. Mm. That, that's, that's great to know that there are companies that are doing so well out there. Uh, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? The only thing I'd add to that, and look, it took until 2022 for there to be a women's health strategy, and things like endometriosis finally included in that, which I think uh, is a huge step forward. But as chair of the Women and Equalities Select Committee, the thing that has really struck me, whenever I'm talking to women in a whole variety of sectors, the, the thing that's keeping women out of some workplaces still mm. is lack of access to toilet facilities. Mm. And um, I, I find it astonishing that that is still an issue in the 21st century, a quarter of the way through the 21st century. Mm. So it's really clear that some sectors have a, a long way to go on that still. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll run the mic to you. We'll run the mic to you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I'm the founder of Yara. So we offer holistic treatment plants uh, for women like who are going through menopause. So uh, we have started like one year back, and we have over thousands of customers who have uh, successfully managed their menopause journey. That involves doctors from NHS, people who are working in MNCs, right? Actually, we have tried approaching all these MNCs through our users, but actually none of those conversations materialized. Right? So we approach corporate saying that we are offering a mental health solution. That actually works. But when you say that we actually offer menopause, like solutions for menopause, it actually never materializes. Right? So uh, since startups are vehicles of disruptions, what, do you, what advice do we have so for startup founders like us to actually make us like to to make it to actually help us work along with these MNCs to make providing solutions for menopause now. I'll start with that. Just briefly, I'd say keep at it, keep working at it. Change takes a frustratingly a huge amount of time, particularly when it comes to women and taboo subjects. And I'm not sure menopause is the last taboo, but it's certainly up there with them. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I think that when people get it and this starts being vogue and very much the thing that is expected in the workplace, then the floodgates open and change happens very quickly. So you want to be there when that point happens, but we're not quite at that tipping point yet. Anyone else got anything to add on that one? No? Should we go for one last question in the audience? Yes, we will run the mic to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that's not my job. <laughs> uh, hi, Meredith Brown, founder of Menopause 51. Um, so my question really is that I get the sense now that a lot of the talk around HRT is that you should be taking it, whether or not 
your daily symptoms are overwhelming um, or you're not able to, say, manage them through like lifestyle changes and, and supplements and things, um, primarily because of the longer-term health benefits, which I know you mentioned osteoporosis, for example, I know type 2 diabetes, dementia and other things there. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that really, because I do get the sense that it's almost been starting to be pushed out on people rather than it's still being, I guess, a yeah, choice, an educated yeah, yeah, informed yeah, choice. Can I, can I start with this one? Um, I, I think that because it has been such a um, taboo around HRT for so long, um, the pendulum has to swing a little bit the other way before it levels itself out and I think that is why there are so many companies out there saying HRT, HRT, HRT. It's not for everyone. It is everyone's choice whether they go on it or not. However, it does have a lot of benefits. As you mentioned, uh, osteoporosis, heart disease, um, many, many others, helps with symptoms um, and things like that is, is not going to be for everyone and some women can't use HRT for health reasons um, and some women will choose not to. Uh, I have some stats. I, I kind of skipped over them because honestly, I could talk for hours about the stats. Um, let me find them for a second. Uh, so basically, there was there was this one study uh, done in two, 2002 by Women's Health Initiative uh, on combined estrogen and progestin, which is a type of, uh, or it's a synthetic type of progesterone or does a similar job. That study was stopped prematurely because of the slight increase in breast cancer. I think the media were quite irresponsible with how they dealt with that information and what information they put out. And a lot of uh, even um, a, a lot of people uh, were told to come off HRT. Over 50 percent of women overnight came off HRT. Now, that's probably more detrimental to their health than not being on it at all. So the same company came out with a second study in 2012 uh, that said that they overestimated the initial safety parameters and the small increase in risk predominantly affected HRT, uh, those on HRT over 10 years after menopause. Or what they actually meant in that study was they started 10 years after menopause, which is something that we're not going to do anyway. But despite all of this information, the information from that 2002 study is it, it either is less applicable or not applicable at all because of modern HRT we have different formulations and we have different recommended doses and I think that's where the stigma has come from um, and that is why the pendulum has to swing a little bit too far and we do have people that are saying get on HRT try and get rid of that bad rep that it has and I think that's why we do need to speak about it so much more um, because we've got to break that stigma before we balance it back out. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? Well, I might just add as the only one probably that hasn't been on HRT on the panel, and I'm much older than most as well. Um, I just, I didn't really know much about it, I dare say, but I had a little bit maybe your experience at first that I don't want to take anything artificial, yeah. synthetic. This is a natural process that all women go through all over the world and if I can cope with it with the symptoms that I've got, which I have to say were not serious, but were, went on for many, many years, then that's my choice and that's what I want to do. I think that's still yeah. a choice for everybody, Definitely. isn't it? Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. Does anyone else have any Can I just say, and I mean, it absolutely has to be a choice, but I don't feel that symptoms should have to be overwhelming before you take HRT. If you've got mild symptoms, why not if it's going to improve them? But the thing that I really notice, uh, and this is only from the perspective of a constituency MP, is how hard women are still having to fight to get it prescribed. And I was really lucky. There was a menopause specialist uh, nurse in my doctor's practice, and I bowled in there. I had to have two telephone consultations before she'd give me a appointment to see her. And I'm literally shouting down the phone, give me HRT now. <laughs> um, but I'm getting constituents of mine, because I had a great experience, and she went, yes, take the tablet, please go away. Um, I'm having constituents contact me saying they're going to see their GP two, three times and literally begging to prescribe it. And I'm sorry, a little bit gender specific here. Older male doctors still telling them, well, your symptoms aren't overwhelming or you've only got three or four symptoms. What are you worried about? So although it feels like, uh, and, there are, and I'm guilty of it, 
Uh, and I had a fabulous conversation with Louise Newson, who is also guilty. We said, just get a prescription. Um, I think it's great. It's, it's changed my life. It's meant I sleep at night. And I spent three years as a government minister thinking it was normal to be awake between the hours of two and five every single night. Um, and it wasn't normal. Uh, it, it's changed my life. It's made me a much nicer person, um, much calmer, uh, all sorts of benefits. But the reality <laughs> is that um, too many people, too many women, are coming to me still saying, I'm having to have an argument with my GP. I'm, I now say, right, tell me which surgery it is. I'm picking the phone up. <laughs> I should write another article in my local paper next week. Yeah. But Caroline, do you not think we've got a problem with the number of trained GPs on this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So that's yeah. we need and to do something. All, and that's one of the recommendations it's, of the committee's report, um, which actually has some pushback from some medics saying we don't need to be trained. Yeah. So yes, you do. If you're going to have a female patient, you need to be trained at it. Yeah. Not, it's not a um, compulsory curriculum for uh, to to be a doctor to it study menopause, yeah, and absolutely. every woman is going to go through it, and therefore it should be. Yeah. Why is it uh, you can get HRT over the counter in Europe, rest of Europe, and here we need prescription? Well, so and we have made progress literally in the last few weeks, I think, even that there is one form of uh, HRT cream, I think. Yeah that you can now get over the counter. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We're terribly protectionist about what drugs can only be prescribed by uh, doctors still. And I would dearly love to see a, a much more flexibility given to pharmacists about mm -hmm. what they can give you. If you've been prescribed one version, you don't have it in stock. You know, they know um, very well what the alternatives are. So I do think there needs to be a kind of a, a, a rethink on some of the prescribing requirements that are still in place. Mm. I also think that as women, we need to support each other. And I think there is still this, oh, you're an HRT kind of. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's definitely not helpful no. for anyone. If someone as wants well. to take it or not take it, they shouldn't be judged from yeah. it because it's an individual choice. Yeah. If you want to take it, that's fine. But yeah, too often I see women being judged for taking HRT like even in my own community, like I had a was talking to a black woman and she was telling me about her symptoms and she made me feel about that big for taking HRT. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked. Mm -hmm. I didn't realise how entrenched the stigma around it was. Mm. I had a conversation with my hairdresser who literally looked at me and said, Oh, you're not taking that, are you? It's really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's very, very few other drugs that are have the same stigma against them. Or if you tell someone that you're on them, then um, oh, crack or okay. <laughs> <laughs> medication. Should we call them medication? <laughs> yeah, that one there's definitely should be a stigma around. Um, anyone else got anything to add? I love this conversation. I could go on forever. No. Uh, I would yes. say is that you know you're quite right. It's informed choice, and there are plenty of countries around the world where they seem to sell through menopause, famously in Japan. Mm -hmm. The word for menopause in Japan is kanenki. I'm probably saying that horribly wrong, but it means energy, uh, mm -hmm. or it means renewal years, mm -hmm. because that's that's what's happened, and, and they mm -hmm. don't have the symptoms that we do. And I think 20% of women in this country do not get any symptoms mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we haven't talked a lot about HRT, but you know, you're absolutely right. It has to be informed. Yeah. And we're not informed, and it has to be a choice, and we don't have much of a choice. <laughs> Uh, I think we should move on from HRT because we could all talk about that for so long. Uh, Caroline, uh, one of the questions that has come through on uh, YouTube is, can you explain what difference it will actually make if menopause becomes a protected characteristic? Yeah, God, I can try and make this a quick answer. So look, I think and the, the committee has not called for it to be one. We've said that the government should do a consultation on it. We need to find out the pros and cons. Um, but the and I used one of the stats earlier is that women and when women take a, an employment tribunal case, actually, that's a failure of workplace policies. Isn't it? I don't want any woman to have to take a case to tribunal because I want them all to be treated brilliantly by their employers. The reality is, is that too few women can take a tribunal case because uh, it's really difficult to define menopause. And the reality is of the 
the 44 cases that have been brought citing menopause, the vast majority of them have been done under disability discrimination grounds. Now, look, to me, it's wholly unacceptable that a woman going through the menopause is having to use disability discrimination grounds when bringing a, a tribunal case. So we've said to government, look, let's consider the options as to whether you can make menopause a protected characteristic so, or enact Section 14 of the Equalities Act so that you can do it under two grounds, because that they can literally do it at the stroke of pen, a piece of delegated legislation done, as opposed to making it a protected character, so it could be quite long-winded and time-consuming. So I just want women who have had a lousy time from their employer, who have been pushed out of the workplace, to have those employment rights that we would expect. Um, and so I think it it could make a difference, it could empower them. I think it's still a hell of a decision to take, to take your employer to a tribunal. Uh, and I'd love us to be in a position where nobody had to do that on any grounds at any time, but we don't live in a perfect world. Okay, perfect. Um, we have one last question here. And the question is, what? I'm gonna open this up to everyone. Uh, what do you hope the corporate, hope, wait, what do you hope the corporate menopause landscape looks like in 10 years time? Who would like to start with this one? Well, I guess I will. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> Look, I'm not sure I'm going to answer that properly, but what I'm going to say, and we never do this, is we need to look back at the progress we've made in the last 10 years. And this would just, this event wouldn't be happening. This would not have been a conversation. You know, I spent the whole of my corporate career in fear of talking about women's progression in the workplace. It was a seriously career limiting, water cooler conversation amongst a few senior women where are all the women that was just a decade ago so look, i think you know i think we've come a hugely long way um we're gradually breaking down all of these taboos uh, i in a decade's time maybe it depends on the government yeah you know i think and and because government support is important yeah and I we've think, got to keep government support the government could uh bring forward an employment bill that would be a start i'm waiting one for one of those for two years um I was at a brilliant event, of, I don't know, probably three weeks ago with Henpicked and the Menopause Friendly Workplace Awards. And it's roughly 25% of all employers have a menopause or have an accredited workplace menopause policy. Uh, now, Denise said earlier, that means 75% of them don't. My view is if that quarter could all go find a friend, it can be one of their competitors, it can be a supplier, it can be somebody that they collaborate with. We just need to grow that number. And I think, you know, in 10 years time, I want every employer to have uh, an environment in their workplace where they're supporting women going through the menopause, actually where they're supporting women. Mm. And leadership capabilities are changing massively. I mean, if you think of leaders of old, they didn't have to talk about any of these topics. They have to understand them all now. And I think gradually, one by one, you know, male suicide, mental health, we've still got a long way to go on that. But I'd like to think in a decade that we've licked them all. And we have a set of business leaders in Britain that have these type of topics, managing diversity, managing health across across you know all its forms, um, that they are completely skilled and competent in that. And right now there's a few gaps. Okay. Any anything to add? No. Yes. In ten years' time I'd like to see menopause as understood and as dealt with as pregnancy. I like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Say so, anything to add? Um, I just want the stigma to be taken out of it mm. uh, from people whispering it or not talking about it. Mm. I think it should just be commonplace, like a woman being pregnant. Yeah. Simple. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there should be, uh, this stigma should be removed and yes. everyone, everyone should have knowledge on it. Um, I think that would be what I would like to see in 10 years time. I have one final quick fire question for the panelists. Uh, so the quick fire question is, what is one thing each audience member should take away from the panel and implement tomorrow from our talk this evening? Caroline, would you like to be start? Be brave enough to talk about menopause at work. Love that. <laughs> Same as before, use your voice, lift your head, walk tall, mm -hmm. do something about it. Don't be scared. Don't be scared, I like that. Think about what you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so perfect. Awesome. Um, 
Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today um, and coming out on this. I almost said Tuesday. It's Wednesday, isn't it? Wednesday evening. It's Tuesday. It Tuesday. is Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Has it been that long of a week already? Okay. This Tuesday evening, um, and for anyone that would like to learn more about any of the initiatives that we spoke about today, um, and also Zuki's Corporate Menopause Bundle, watch out for an email that you will receive some point this week. Uh, and thank you again for coming out, and have a safe journey home. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Well said. I think I'm sweating. No, they're not. No, thank you.